Where are you going to put it? We got all kinds of good ones. Considering the fact that holding that they were storing there, the bottles of Pepsi and honey, and all this kind of crap, like, what's the other kind of food? <laughs> like potato chips and every every snooze and then I don't pile up. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It's a good and then picture, Gary though. put the towers. Yeah, he did. Yeah. I thought about it, though. <laughs> I thought you were just like, you're right. Nobody knows. She got a commission on those? You hide it well. I just check my card. After 12, the company is called Punches, and you get a third So all of us that were in line got a card, and she just got a couple of cupcakes and some pies.
to keep the numbers up. Um, so I think most, most observers agree that at least in the mid, near to midterm, the outlook's, outlook is pretty grim, right? Uh, the question is, the debate is whether it's simply just another cyclical downturn uh, or maybe an unusual but temporary slump due to the post-2008 recession, or is this a long-term and radically constricted new normal? Uh, I tend to think that it, it's the latter, that, that things are changing and radically, and not simply because of the economy. Um, but we are facing, I think, a long-term restructuring of the legal market, and that restructuring is reflected in the declining demand for new lawyers and the decreasing appeal of the legal education. And then inevitably, law libraries are going to face some of the effects of this. Uh, so what I'm asking is, what will remain of law libraries as we have known them? Uh, this is where I can skip over uh, the Henderson part again. We've all seen. Um, OK, so we're, we're, this, this, we're, our students are graduating into a depressed legal market. Uh, and I think this is, as Bill Henderson has suggested, and Richard Susskind, that this is just not, not just due to uh, less hiring or less uh, corporate employment of, of law firms. Uh, there are two things. I think there are two, at least two crises going on at the same time. One is the economic crisis that we've talked about, affecting both the job market and the pool of law school applicants. And the second one is a crisis of confidence in the ability of law schools and the ABA accreditation process to respond and to meet the needs of lawyers or society at large. I think it's that second crisis, the second crisis of confidence, that feeds into and magnifies the first one. Uh, can we turn off the screen, the front light up here? Does anyone know how to do that? We're good. Can you see it? It's just which <laughs> one? I spent a lot of time picking out key pictures, so I like to do Well, you can see I'm on those screens. Um, okay. They're looking at all the other screens, not that. Okay. Job market is down, and it's not just because of the recession, although the recession has played a part in teaching clients to be more cost, uh, cost conscious. Um, again, looking at largely the corporate, the corporate client, the high end, uh, cor uh, corporate clients and in house counsel are demanding greater cost savings with respect to what they expect to spend on legal services. Um, they're examining their legal costs much more, and they're expecting them to be efficient. And law, law, lawyers aren't, no, aren't quite sure what to do with that. Um, in addition, much of the work that had traditionally been done by newer associates of larger firms, like document review, uh, pre-trial pre discovery, is now being outsourced overseas or uh, replaced outright by automated review technology, such as predictive, pre predictive coding. Uh, larger law firms are hiring few, fewer new graduates, and when they do hire, many of them prefer to hire laterally after associates have been trained uh, at other jobs. Firms are also increasingly turning to hiring temporary contract attorneys, who while admittedly doing legal work, do so for 20 to $30 an hour, perhaps, with no benefits and no prospect of permanent employment. This all might be a, uh, less of a burden, the increasing cost of law school might be less of a burden if the JD had continued to provide a reasonably sure entry into the professional, uh, professional career. But the fact that law schools have been graduating twice as many lawyers as there are jobs for years now has effectively destroyed that traditional path in the professional class. Law schools answer, many of them, by claiming that the JD is a highly flexible qualification that benefits graduates in any number of career choices. But the evidence is doubtful. Certainly, most schools can claim some highly successful business people among their alumni, but many of these people use their law degree, in quotes, uh, in very vague ways. Uh, other law degrees find that their degree leaves them overqualified for many jobs. And we've all heard stories of uh, 
law grads from recently well regarded law schools that are working for minimum wage at Starbucks. But at least at Starbucks, they're getting health benefits. So this leads to this crisis of confidence. Um, the perception of this of this diminished value of the law degree and uh, certainly at least below the, the top 15, 14 or 25 schools, however you draw the line, and the reluctance of many law school faculty and many deans to respond to the problem have contributed to a widespread sense that law schools, if they're not affirmatively taking advantage of students, are at least willfully blind to their problems. Instead of um, Instead of squarely facing the economic problems of the graduates, uh, law schools by and large sought to, uh, to justify their costs with appeals to the supposed flexibility of the all-purpose law degree, or to blame students, blame law students for believing their own hype. Meanwhile, law schools have continued to raise tuition every year. Legal education began to look self-serving. It's not actually a scam to exploit naive and misinformed potential law students. The image of law schools has also been tarnished within the profession by widespread complaints that the law school is, in, that law school is ineffective in teaching the skills a lawyer needs. We've all heard this as well. The claim, complaints are familiar, but have recently seemed to gain more traction. Law professors, according to the, the complaints, are unable to or uninterested in teaching real law. Professors spend too much time on scholarship that is of no practical use to the profession the third year of law school is invariably a waste of time. Now, one response to these problems, one possible response to these problems, uh, perhaps through a strengthening of the ABA accreditation process, is also discredited. Law professors and deans view accreditation as an expensive and unwelcome interference. A generation ago, the accreditation visit was an opportunity to uh, extract resources from the university. Right? Uh, new and improved buildings, added resources for faculty salaries, and increased library budgets. But the APA has lost a lot of its teeth. University presidents routinely define the APA and win, if not outright, at least by achieving compromises that weaken the APA's stand overall. The results of this discrediting are somewhat paradoxical. While faculty and deans view the APA process as a pointless annoyance, the practicing bar and judges dismiss it as a tool controlled by those same self-interested law professors and deans. But in, that the ABA is, is ineffective in ensuring that legal education meets the needs of the profession or of the public that the profession serves. The lack of support for the ABA coming from any corner makes it unlikely that it will be effective either as a force for reform or as a conservative voice preserving and strengthening the traditional values of legal education. The ABA is trying to respond, right? There are, uh, they're trying to change their accreditation standards from inputs to outcome measures. Input measures such as physical plant, numbers of faculty, size of faculty offices, faculty student ratios, and budget figures, we have always counted them because they're easy to count. Well, outcomes are less tangible. Libraries have lots of things that count, lots of things to count. Volume numbers, acquisitions budgets, hours of service, circulation, and IRL numbers, and so on. Basing measures of quality on input, therefore, tends to benefit traditionally resource-heavy institutions such as libraries or law schools with large libraries. Connections between library resources or services and educational outcomes, however, are more difficult to make. And I think it's important to remember that the ABA standards have always been meant to be minimum standards. The preamble to the standards says that these are minimum requirements designed, developed, and implemented for the purpose of advancing the basic goal of providing a sound program of legal education. Law librarians and others have tried to push the ABA in the direction of not minimum standards, but best practices, to adopt the, uh, encourage the adoption of standards that in fact aim to improve the status of libraries and librarians. However, the increasing disparity between the cost of legal education and the employment prospects of the graduates is strengthening calls for reforming the ABA standards downward, or even abolishing accreditation altogether. 
Uh, there was a hearing just yesterday in Washington on uh, accreditation generally, and apparently the uh, uh, Congressional Education Committee, whoever it was, across the board, Republicans and Democrats, are pretty skeptical of allowing accreditation by association accreditors to go on as it has been. Okay. Um, The ABA Council on Legal Education and Admissions to the Bar, which monitors the standards, does not seem interested in this approach, in the best practices of philosophy. In uh, 2010, they removed Standard 10 104, which had provided that, quote, a, a, uh, an approved law school should seek to exceed the minimum standards, the minimum requirements of the standards. They took that out. Um, dissatisfaction with the accreditation process, as we know it, is also reflected in moves by New York, California, and a few other states that have been starting to impose their own standards. We heard about um, the new 50-hour uh, pro bono requirement for law for New York, the fact that uh, the New York bar has radically uh, constricted the amount of uh, distance education that can be counted for admission to the bar. All of these pressures are converging to force hard choices on law schools. For a long time, law schools have been able to raise tuition at will, confident that uncapped, federally guaranteed student loans would ensure a steady supply of students able to pay. Increasing scrutiny of legal education and the increasing likelihood of default on student loans means that this flow of money to law schools may be curtailed. Some foresee drastic limitations on federally guaranteed student loans. New revenues are not going to appear simply by encouraging admissions or development officers to work harder. Law schools are going to have to cut expenses. Law librarians know this better than anyone, as libraries have borne the brunt of budget reductions for years. But until recently, at least, the idea of the existence of the autonomous law library has been sacrosanct. And my question is, will this continue as there remain fewer things left to cut? Where can law schools cut expenses? Are they going to stop hiring new faculty, lower faculty salaries, uh, impose higher teaching loads with less time for scholarship, uh, maybe lower research and travel stipends, fewer interdisciplinary centers and programs, fewer student scholarships, uh, less administrative staff, and which ones would they cut? Would be career services, alumni, development, IT, less technology, fewer clinics, or cut the law school support for the library. I think if you look at the priority all of these different parts of the law school, different programs hold, I think the library may be the most vulnerable. Consider where law school tuition goes, where tuition increases go. Huge increases in dean and faculty salaries significantly reduce teaching loads, dramatically expanded leave policies, expensive marketing campaigns, uh, high-end merit scholarship recipients, these are all the things that, that, that deans that mark the, the tenure of recent deans. That's what they want to do. That's how they, I get, they uh, distinguish themselves. A lot of libraries have been spared the worst for a long time by the simple fact that U.S. News ranking is driven largely by expenditures for students. Those, rank, those algorithms change, though. Um, when the money was plentiful, thanks to the open flow of guaranteed student loans, the library was as good a place as any to spend. Uh, but these, these input measures made little distinction with regard to how that money was spent. Now, however, schools have to set priorities and choose where the more limited resources are going to go. Uh, I don't think the smart money is going to bet on law schools cutting resources for faculty. Um, given a choice, neither deans nor faculty are going to report reduced support for faculty or for faculty scholarship. The culture of academic reputation, the culture of prestige, is too strong. I think it's much easier to cut in essentials than to change the nature of an entire academic discipline. From the perspective of the faculty, at least, law schools are first and foremost scholarly institutions. For faculty, law libraries are not that essential to producing their scholarship. Now, when I talk about, when I say that law libraries are doomed, 
I, I do that to bring people to the room, right? I don't mean that all libraries, all law libraries will disappear, although I think a few schools will operate successfully without anything resembling a law library as we know it. What I mean is the, the, li the law library as we know it, the law library as an iconic place within the law school, managed financially and administratively as part of the law school, and with staff devoted to the law school. And by devoted, I mean a couple of different things. I mean staff who serve the law school and not the rest of the university libraries or the rest of the university, at least primarily. And traditionally, staff who are sort of pleased to be part of the law school. You know, there's a certain, or at least has been, I think, a certain prestige to being a law library, right? which sort of made this sort of the aura effect of uh, the legal profession itself. So I think this is, model is going to become increasingly rare, but not disappear. Uh, I think when times were good and law schools could use ABA accreditation to push universities around a bit, attractive libraries were useful bargaining chips. But now times are getting bad. Law schools are going to have to make deep cuts. And I'm afraid that all libraries will be among the first on the chopping block. I don't think they will simply shut down their libraries or hand them off to central administration, or at least not many of them will. Rather, I think law libraries will be chipped away notch by notch by attrition and of personnel and of services. But I also think the faculty won't protest, or at least they won't protest too much. In the literature on legal education reform, there's a lot of it out there. Everybody's talking, you know, has their ideas. Libraries, if they're mentioned at all, are almost universally described as wasteful, unnecessary, and outdated sign of the input-based measurement of law school quality. While legal writing is measured, mentioned with some regularity as an important skill, mostly, of course, by legal writing faculty, <laughs> legal research is rarely mentioned at all. Um, I posted a comment about this on Facebook uh, earlier this year. Deans have resisted ABA accreditation for years. The ABA review process is no longer a ticket to a new building. Deans and faculty treat it as a nuisance to be ignored when they can't actively flout it. Now the result is that we have a patchwork of, we will have we will have a patchwork of standards from 50 states and who knows what other authorities. Legal historians are still attached to traditional law libraries, but most faculty do all their legal research electronically or more likely have their research assistants or reference librarians do it for them. Furthermore, most trendy and cutting edge scholarship now is interdisciplinary or empirical. Old fashioned doctrinal scholarship has been out of fashion for years. Even traditionally practice oriented law schools are hiring more fancy scholars doing trendy scholarship. The law library has not been the heart of the law school for more than a generation. Certainly faculty aren't going to give up sabbaticals, high salaries, or new faculty hiring for the sake of an autonomous law library. Okay, many librarians insist, well, but our faculty love us, would never let the university take control from the law school. But I think that sentiment grants law faculties more power than they have in the modern university, in the modern, increasingly corporatized university. I don't know a single law school that doesn't love its librarians, but I also don't know a single school that I would rely on to give up other things to protect their autonomous law library when the pressure for centralization grows strong enough. Would your law school turn over admission or development to the central administration to keep the law library under law school control? Or would your faculty give up sabbaticals, take on increased teaching loads, or forego faculty hiring to save the library? Or maybe they want to keep the library so they can raise its budget and space for other needs. In other words, faculty love and $4.99 will buy you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> okay. In the current literature on law school reform, you have to look long and hard to find a defense of the law school library. Paul Campos, who doesn't know who Paul Campos is, he's been blogging about this stuff for a long time. He wrote in an article called The Crisis of the American Law School, 
It seems quite odd to be pumping ever greater sums into bricks and mortar. Changes in information technology that enable education to take place outside of a hundred uh, of a hundred million dollar structure. This point applies with special force to law libraries, which grow ever more pharaonic. I like that. Pharaonic. Um, even as the practice of law becomes less book-based, and as if my own observations are adequate, he says, law students find it less and less necessary or desirable to use these literary labyrinths even as opulent study spaces. He's a fun writer. Um, I think many other opportunities for um, Um, okay. There is a task force, APA task force on the future of legal education. And they might have been following their work. Okay. Of the last time I checked was in March. Uh, of the 50 or so comments that have been received, uh, ranging from short memos to lengthy letters and reports um, on their changes, proposed changes, only one, the letter from the American Association of Law Libraries, Lynching small libraries in a positive light. For many veteran law libraries, some of this is a surprise. Right? Um, when I was discussing this on Facebook at the, uh, this is actually at the ALS meeting back in January. That's what started me thinking about this when I was uh, sitting in a committee of the uh, ALS Committee on Libraries and Technology, or as I took to calling it, the uh, Titanic Deck Chair Rearranging Committee. Uh, Steve Hinckley, Steve Hinckley at Penn State Dickinson School of Law wrote to me on Facebook, says, the APA has been over in all libraries for years now. After completing the last accreditation inspection team he went on, he said, he swore he'd never do another one. All right, so, here we go. What matters most to law schools? Going forward, I don't think it's going to be law libraries. Revenue-generating departments such as development, alumni relations, and career services, and perhaps reputation-enhancing programs like law journals, interdisciplinary programs, and research centers, these will be strengthened, while revenue-draining departments will be cut. Faculty privileges will be preserved and expanded whenever possible. It may be that faculty salaries will eventually decrease, but Faculty and deans will try everything they can think of before that becomes necessary. Legal, research, legal writing programs and clinics, which have been allies with law libraries to some extent in seeking faculty status and resource allocation, will increasingly compete with libraries and each other. The first casualty will be tenure for law library directors. Tenure in higher education is under threat across the board. As law library directors retire or are replaced, it's increasingly rare that their replacements will have full faculty status with tenure. This has been going on for some time. This is not news. Uh, universities are increasingly shifting from tenure track faculty to greater numbers of adjunct and temporary appointments. In this environment, librarians are widely viewed as just another interest group with no real claim to tenure within law schools. Faculty and this is important because faculty and status and tenure have long been seen as important in preserving a voice for the law library. With the loss of tenure, library directors become easily replaceable and disposable staff administrators, or the job becomes yet another part-time administrative staff task to hand off to some faculty member. Advocacy by law librarians may slow the process in some places, but the influence of librarians is diminishing. Legal scholarship is less dependent on traditional legal materials. The arguments for the centrality of the autonomous law library are losing their force. How does this affect us? For ambitious law librarians, I think this may make a, the career path to law library director less attractive. For some, it may be more attractive. You know? um, depends on if they have scholarly ambitions or not. Uh, Maybe this means that fewer individuals will give up the relative security of a mid-level librarian position for the demands and pressures of a uh, director position without the security of tenure. Maybe those ambitious and talented individuals will uh, move to other libraries. Maybe they'll move into the university libraries. 
Either way, I think the loss of talent going into law library directorships will be a loss for law schools as well. What else might libraries lose? Technical services will be, in many places, I think, absorbed more and more into university libraries. That's happening now already, too. Space constraints will cause law libraries, as they have already, to share uh, storage for uh, compact storage with university libraries with a corresponding loss of autonomy over access services. After sharing compact or off-site storage, it's only a few short steps to other kinds of space uh, sharing. Uh, sharing space for what remains of the library's active collection. Reference librarians will be the last to go, right? Uh, but trying to think of what are the essentials that no law school would ever give, uh, give up, um, I couldn't identify much, right? Even reference librarians um, might be shared with other university libraries. In an environment of increasingly interdisciplinary legal scholarship, it might make sense. It might even better serve faculty needs to have librarians who are familiar with but not specialized in disciplines such as political science, sociology, or economics, as well as law. Okay, so I think this is going to be a loss. I think I think uh, the, this will be a loss in terms of the high levels of service that law schools are accustomed to. However, who remembers the Yerker question, the Carl Yerker question, right? What should law libraries stop doing in order to address higher priority initiatives? That applies to law schools, too. Law schools are going to increasingly examine what they will be willing to give up to survive, much less to grow up, to grow and move up in the rankings. That last point, though, rankings may be uh, the best hope for the survival of threatened law school libraries. The elite schools may continue to see the, the iconic law library as a signal of their elite status, although some elites have already seen the control of key functions uh, like Harvard. Other one of the lower prestige schools may also want to distinguish themselves from their less elite competitors by maintaining something like a traditional law library. So this is all pretty grim. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I am. I don't want to see law libraries disappear. Um, but I think we need to look at the, the, uh, the actual realities out there closely. Um, I don't think that the ABA accreditation is going to save law libraries. Um, I don't know that law faculty and deans are going to fall on their swords to save law libraries. And maybe if, this ch if these changes happen, this wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Uh, I do think that law schools have to shrink admissions and, uh, and control costs. They have to shrink. There's too many lawyers, there's too many, too many graduates who aren't even getting law jobs. I think they need to do this not only for their own survival, but to ensure access to legal services for other than large corporate clients. Law libraries serve law schools, and law schools serve or ought to serve the public interest. If the crisis of legal education inspires legal educators to a renewed commitment to the public interest, something more valuable than traditional libraries may be gained. Okay. And now Ken will demolish my argument. Not quite. <laughs> To begin with, I am compelled to state that I agree with all of Professor Miller's underlying observations, and I'll even expand upon them a little bit. And I do believe that for at least some law schools, if not for the wider system of legal education, the two, two of the crises you talked about add up to an existential threat. And ironically, this is despite ongoing discussions and long time discussions of a vast underserved market of legal services consumers, mostly at the low end of economic resources. And there's, a, there's an article where the title basically addresses that by Emily Spieler, The Paradox of Access to Civil Justice, The Glut of New Lawyers, and the Persistence of Unmet Need. And if, it's partly a distribution issue, but it's obviously much more than that. 
uh, and its analysis of uh, likely law school cost cutting in response to the crises, Jim finds that the library may be most vulnerable. And in fact, he identifies the high cost of maintaining research libraries given the near monopoly pricing that takes place in the, in the world. Of, I'm sorry, he's quoting Professor Sullivan here. Who's, uh, you all have had the benefit of Jim's paper, I have. Uh, he's quoting Professor Sullivan, who's, who's uh, Thomas E. Sullivan, who did deliver the 2012 James P. White lecture on legal education, uh, who says that the high cost of maintaining research libraries, given the near monopoly pricing that takes place in the world book market, as one of the eight factors he considers core cost drivers of legal education. So given that I generally agree with Professor Millis and his sources that he's relying on, that legal education is a crisis with multiple foundations, why do I at least somewhat disagree with his conclusion that law libraries are due? And part of that, and a large part of that, comes down to that we're both trying to say what's likely to happen. Now, I have been for several years a member of the Cali Board of Directors, and as part of that work, this year, in fact, in two days, we're having a retreat. And as part of the preparation for that retreat, uh, we're, we're going to engage in scenario planning, which is based on a book by Peter Schwartz, The Art of a Long View. And if you don't want to get that book, you can get a good sense of the process in the Wikipedia article on scenario planning. Having read through the book, I remain a believer in the value of strategic planning but I found little in the book that raised my confidence that attempts to predict future scenarios are anything more than educated guesses. So Jim and I are both making our own educated guesses today, as many of you have to do every day when making choices. To me, the book's true value on scenario planning was that preparing for, as the author recommends, three different possible futures increases your odds of having an appropriate response ready because you have gained them out but nevertheless, it does not guarantee success. So he and I, Jim and I, are both engaged in the act of envisioning scenarios for law schools just beyond the range of the short term, which is, I call, the next one to five years. We agree on the history and the facts that he cited. Law schools have been overproducing graduates for many years, at least as the current legal services delivery system is structured, and we don't likely have it in our power to make significant changes in that delivery structure over that time frame. The cost of attending many law schools does not calculate into a positive return on investment for most of their law students in the present economic climate, and this may not change for some time at best. Tenured law factory who govern at most university affiliated law schools are not want to embrace cost reduction efforts that reduce their salaries or increase their teaching loads. And most of those same faculty have yet to see the need to revise curricula in a substantial way, and that is really a big part of the problem is that most of you are at least aware, if not committed to this change already, we are preaching to the choir here for the most part today. An additional set of problems that Jim didn't mention much is brought by the prospective students themselves. What are they to expect of a law school? The majority of 1Ls enter immediately following the completion of the bachelor's degree program, although given there are a substantial number who have other education or careers behind them. So for the majority, the previous 16 years of their life has been spent toiling in a series of schools from K to 12 and then through the bachelor's degree. Until they reached high school, most of their educational decisions were made on their behalf by their parents, so they did not make independent judgment about this. They went on to college and likely financed it with a combination of family funds, grants, work study, and loans. Somewhere along the way, they decided to attend law school, whether to actively pursue a career as an attorney or for a less well-formed notion of what they would use, what use they would make with a JD. And except for those who already have a family member practicing law, they don't have a realistic expectation of what they're going to be doing when they get out of law school. Because most people who go to law school who don't have a family member who's already practicing envision law school as it appears in pop, I'm sorry, lawyering as it appears in popular culture. Books, to kill a mockingbird, well, I don't know, dance justice like that. Movies, TV, 
TV show, LA Law, The Good Wife, Boston Legal. What? It, it's, there's almost a lawyer effect the same way that recently there's been a CSI effect cited for students who want to enter the um, field of forensic science. I would argue that law schools have an obligation to include in their curricular information and experiences, both curricular, I'm sorry, have an obligation to include in their curricula information and experiences that will help students develop realistic expectations of what their legal careers may include. And in fact, when they go out to pre-law fairs, they have that responsibility as well. So my adding the focus on student expectations simply aggravates the crisis more. It says there's one more thing why students are dissatisfied and don't want to be paying what they're being required to pay. But I'm choosing a different scenario than Professor Millis's as the more likely to reflect the future events. So in his scenario, more and more law school libraries are merged into the parent institution's library. The library is places less important, and the librarians who do serve law school faculty count that among other duties. All that he describes could come to pass. And I will admit that my disagreement with that, my own vision, is as much my hope as it is any scientific basis for saying things are going to be different. Because I am confident that none of us can guarantee what the future is going to look like. But I am confident, too, that in my scenario, some law schools will close. In fact, I'm quite surprised that I haven't heard of any since I went to Duke a few years ago closing. And I devoutly hope that mine is not among them. <laughs> now for, uh, since the four years of, for the four years that I've been in Cincinnati, and for many, many years before that, the library budget has suffered substantial cuts. <coughs> Our previous university president, who left not quite a year ago, was building up what he thought was a necessary change in the university, and that was basically reallocation of funds from existing programs to new programs. And I am hoping that our professor, I'm sorry, our university president and provost will not, as suggested by Professor Henderson, whom you heard this morning in his recent published letter to university presidents, find that closing the law school is the only viable choice. But I do agree that it is pretty much time for many university presidents to fish or cut bait, as the saying goes. If you want to have a, a law school that's serving both students and the public, and all save a very, very few institutions, the university is going to have to commit to several years, at least, of subsidizing the law school. There's no way around it. The role of the ABA, I won't say much about that. I agree with uh, what Jim said, and I, would, and I will add a minute or two to talk about what he didn't go into the details of. Even though standards that do exist can be are flexible, and I'll address the library director standard in chapter six. Which we have um, the standard on autonomy, and then we have six. Standard 603, which sets standards for the director of the law li library, providing that, among other things, <coughs> listen carefully to the language. The director of the law library should have a law degree and a degree in library information science and shall have a sound knowledge of and experience in library administration, as opposed to this statement at the beginning of that standard, a law library shall be administered by a full-time director. So here, for those of you who are familiar with the terminology, we have the difference between mandatory language and precatory language. Shall versus should. Well, the new ADA language, the ADA standards that are currently under discussion, in fact, a couple of people here today have uh, presented a program on this earlier, um, that language is gonna become much more flexible and will not mention either degree if, that's, if the current draft becomes a standard that's still up in the air. And we'll just talk about an appropriate educational background or appropriate education. But even with those standards and showing how precatory they are, it, uh, Jim's own institution, when he left, Professor James Wooten, who was not trained in librarianship, I think I have his name, I need to correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, became director for a couple of years and then um, he was succeeded by Elizabeth Edelman, who is a librarian. 
and at Harvard. We have the well-known case of um, John Palfrey, who was one of the founders of the Berkman Center, became a law librarian, and has been seated by Jonathan Zittrain. Neither of them has library training. And I'm not saying that to disparage them. I'm merely saying that the standard is viewed by Harvard, certainly, is not relevant. And no one has gone around in any wide audience to say that their accreditation should be denied. <laughs> and the security of position that exists in the standard. That, that language remains in the draft, although it may be a little more flexible. And that's largely because the entire scheme of tenure, as Professor Mills was talking about, is under review, and not only in law, but across the universities, or at least in people outside the ivory tower looking in on the ivory tower are talking a lot about tenure and whether it should remain. Um, so the, the draft provision of 603 says the law library, library director shall hold, shall, pardon me, shall hold appointment as a member of the law faculty with the rights and protections according, according to the other members of the full-time faculty under section 405, which is the security position. So with all that we've seen, any likely revision of the standard will allow even more flexibility to deans. So using the standards as a cudgel to preserve the law library's autonomous status will be less successful in the future than it has been in the past. Nevertheless, I disagree that most law libraries will be, uh, no longer be administered by law schools directly. Because while the culture of reputation he describes does exist, Maintaining that reputation, even if legal education comes to place less value on traditional measures of scholarship and certainly much less on traditional measures of inputs, a law school that's successful will require in some form an active library with trained law librarians. Faculty will continue to rely on law librarians to assist in identifying and obtaining the most esoteric resources and will rely on those librarians to ensure maintenance of the more common ones. So the faculty aren't going to be running out and contracting with Lexis and Westlaw, and Bloomberg Law. Assigning these tasks to librarians employed by the university library will not lessen to need the need to have them be trained in law. And although doing so might seem more cost effective to faculty at the law school seeking to avoid imposing lower costs, by changing their own place in the scheme of things, reassigning those librarians results in no cost benefit to the university as a whole. In fact, when I look at the numbers, all, the only cost benefit I see out of that equation is my salary might disappear, but we still need the same number of people dedicated to serving the law faculty. And I think that will continue for so long as Law schools are maintained in either their own buildings or on their own campuses. And there's no guarantee that that will go on forever, but given the amount of capital outlay that's already set in those buildings and campuses, I don't see that changing in the next one to five years for existing law schools. And the reason I don't, the reason that law schools have had their own buildings in the tradition that we've been talking about is that law schools typically occupy their own building, either on the main university campus or in a remote location. And a key reason for this is the pedagogical goal of developing a community of practice. Law schools not only aim to teach students to think like a lawyer, but to live like a lawyer, just as medical schools seek to form a community of practice for future physicians. Thus, medical schools also have dedicated facilities, although in their cases, they have even more singular needs, such as biological labs, pharmaceutical connections, and so forth. So medical schools have dedicated facilities, which are often in close proximity to teaching hospitals, and which typically have a medical library. The dedication of buildings and remote campuses to a professional school students and faculty is distinct from the custom for liberal arts and science graduate departments which often are housed in the same space as the space that hosts the undergraduate departments. So for so long as school, law school faculty and students are in a dedicated building, meeting their needs will require that librarians and managers of access to resources be to a substantial degree housed in the same location. Because the faculty 
aren't going to necessarily go across campus. But and given this is a remote world, access world, and they can order things from the other campuses. But let's not forget who's paying the faculty ultimately, and that's the students. The students need to have access to library resources and librarians. And they need, among other things, teaching and legal, resource, legal research of both online resources and, of course, to a lesser degree, print ones. This is borne out by the experience of law librarians, librarians across the country who hear constantly from either firm attorneys or firm librarians that the new associates are not able to efficiently conduct, conduct research and other menial, seemingly menial things. I don't mean to say research is menial, menial, but in the eyes of a senior associate or a senior partner, it may well be. To, uh, and so the focus we've all been talking about for years on practical skills, that continues. And that's not going to get better if you kick the librarians out of the law school. It only aggravates the problem, especially at those schools where it's the librarians who are handling the research part of research and writing. And of course, it is still common, despite the fact of so much being online, that faculty members will seek out librarians for assistance in obtaining materials, and in some cases, will seek out librarians to help them do their own research since they don't have a ready cadre of research assistants. Now, one might argue that absent the requirement containing the standard, having trained law librarians on site does not require the librarians report to a director on, under the control of the law school. But as I said a moment ago, on the other hand, I don't see how you get significant cost savings by shifting their administration to the university librarian. So I submit that most law schools will continue operating under the, li the library, under the administrative direction of the dean and faculty. And my definition of law library means an operation whose mission is to provide both services and resources optimized to meet the research, teaching, and learning needs of the school's faculty and students. It does not mean merely a place where one goes to find particular books or other printed materials or to study which I would submit is what it means to the people that Jim was quoting who say so much, it doesn't make sense to sink so much money into these ostentatious things. I agree, it doesn't make sense to do that anymore. But I don't think that's happening in the law schools that are being built. So in terms of administrative control and dedicated staff, on those two of the three points that Professor Millis was raising, I disagree with him. Now I'll turn to his last point, the library is iconic place. This is already a trend, certainly in new law school buildings, but it is as much a function in the shift to digital materials as it is to any other cause. In my, now, that's not to say that space hasn't been lost by libraries all along. In, in my 19 years at Duke, this happened several times um, with various offices formerly located in the law library being space being turned over. It happened recently, I believe at the beginning of last academic year where some in the new journal space was taken out of where some library carols were. In Cincinnati, several years before my arrival, one entire floor of the library was given over to the Ohio Innocence Project. They make very good use of the space. Uh, I'm certainly happy to have them there. Recently opened law school buildings such as Eckstein Hall at Marquette and the Thomas Jefferson School of Law still have significant dedicated library space. Although in Marquette, they'll tell you the library is designed to be integral with the rest of the building in a concept called the Library Without Borders. And those of us who visited them two years ago saw a very lovely and functional space. And as, I don't need to log back in right now, thank you. As law well, libraries shift more resources in the digital form, less space needs to be set aside for traditional holdings of reporters and journals. Certainly, we've canceled our most of our reporters and most of our journals as have dozens of other schools. More and more, though, library directors view modern law libraries as a hybrid of electronic and print resources, and that, the, that hybrid balance between electronic and print will, for some time to come, keep, continue, keep continuing the shift from print towards electronic. And at the same time, more directors see a high level of customized service provided by staff as the key deliverable rather than the library serving as a warehouse of legal publishing. 
So it's likely that within newer law buildings, collaborative workspace and private study space will become more valuable than shelf space. And that's true in renovated existing buildings as well. So I certainly agree with those who argue that dedicating a large portion of law school space to the maintenance of print materials will not be sustainable. However, in a hybrid law library where service is, is as or more important than a physical collection, ready access to skilled assistance and the big dedicated educational programming that librarians can perform will still make a centralized home for librarians and the related professionals in IT and media technology support, both efficient and desirable. The library is an iconic space that occupies the single largest portion of building floor space and is filled with rows of books it does have a limited life ahead. But purpose-filled space that provides workspace for librarians and students, small group meeting places, small classrooms and labs, <laughs> and accessible shelving for printed materials that are either not available online or are best used in their printed format will still be a needed component of any efficient law school building. The space may not be as large and iconic as it once was, and in some instances it may not carry the name library, but there you will still find librarians and ready access to the work that they, and I will proudly say we, do. And with that, we have a few minutes left over for questions. Tom's hand went up first, at least in my field of view, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm kind of a I'm kind of a crude individual, so I've got a two-part question for each of you. Uh, who, who or what determines the outcome of law school resource competitions? And can that person, thing, or group stand up to the will of a truly determined university president or provost? I don't see how, uh, well, in most cases, I don't see how that could stand up to the will of a truly determined university president or provost, unless there is a personality, a long-standing personality support standing behind the dean of law school with an existing President and, and but you think at the law school level, the dean is the determined? I think that the law school represents, I'm sorry, the dean represents the law school in the communications and discussion at the table with the university administration. I don't generally see faculty going to bat for the law school at the highest level of administration. I think um, it, it, it depends on the school. Um, as to who makes the decision, but uh, I think increasingly, as part of the, the corporatization of the university, the deans are becoming more powerful and faculty are becoming less so. Uh, and I think who's going to stand up to the university pro president or provost? Uh, nobody until, unless you know, people across the university are standing up to the president or provost. I mean, I say this in, a, in the wake of a $3 million raid on Cornell Law School's reserve by the, by the provost in the, in the wake of the endowment contraction in 2008. Uh, there's no more money at the university level than there is at the law school level. Right. And I'm not, I, I'm not sure I heard either of you really account for that. I don't care. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there's no more. In our situation, there certainly is no more money at the university level. but. The question for us became, and what, and what we mightily object to, is the university deciding, or the president of the university deciding to take existing money in favor of new programs away, not just from us, but other existing programs on campus. And it is there a matter of priorities. And yes, you can have those priorities at, at the top, but if you're going to do that priority shifting, you need to be fully cognizant of what's going to happen, and that president was largely choosing to ignore what was happening. The current president, who has been in office not quite an hour, not quite a year. <laughs> <laughs> time, time flies. Uh, at least from what I can tell from my distance from the current president, is not carrying forward on that same kind of reallocation. Other questions? Gordon? Okay. One of the things I disagree with you, and I think fundamentally, is that the, the law school as a separate entity exists because of the standards. And the reality aspect is that we shrink the law schools, which is what's happening, the need for having them as separate entities be 
becomes less and less important. They become more like other departments, other graduate programs, other institutions. And institutionally, if I was an institution, I'd be sitting there saying, why have this separate entity that claims that more and more of what it does is, is actually cross-disciplinary, more interested in the rest of the university's pieces, that it should be brought in with those pieces to be more effective and efficient. And clearly, at least the current standards and the adoption that they're looking at doesn't change this core belief that the, the law school should be separate. But I think fundamentally, if we look at a changing world and, and look at Jim's sort of issue of we're producing too many um, lawyers, then a graduate program that we see as smaller, more efficient, and part of the rest of the graduate program in the institution makes sense. And that's where I think that is the threat that, that you're looking at from a sort of threat standpoint. That's where we're moving to. And I think the provost and presidents are eventually going to say, it doesn't make sense. The ABA standards on this don't make sense. We want to have a smaller institutional body for law more integrated the other pieces, and we don't need a separate library, it becomes part of that core library that supports those institutional needs. Well, I, I think as to that decision, I think the standards are or will become irrelevant. And so I agree with you on that fact. I disagree with you at least in the one to five year time frame that a large number of schools are gonna reach the conclusion that they wanna move um, law study into a more integrated environment. And my reason for that is, first of all, again, in my time frame that I'm talking about, there's a lot of invested capital in what exists now. But as importantly, until someone can demonstrate a lot otherwise, there's still a need. And there's no less of a need based on what the practicing bar is complaining about to have a professional environment and community of practice. And I think if law school were to emphasize the community of practice, and by doing that partly through more skills involving not only technology but all skills, that would serve law students better. So I don't know that I fully responded to your question, but that's my best shot. Others? I, I'm, I'm sorry that my talk went so long, and because I really wish we had more time to, to talk, but I, I will be happy to receive your complaints and gripes uh, in the hallway. Um, just, just a couple of things, because I, I was looking at the comments uh, on the talk. One thing is, is you know, people say, well, how do we, I don't see how centralization of services is going to really save costs. And I agree, but that's not my decision. I don't want to make those decisions. And university administrators think it does, right? And the other thing is, is um, about what choices faculty will make, faculty and deans, uh, they don't always make wise decisions either. Thank you all Thank very you. much for coming.